Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I've lived in my house for over 15 years and never had any issues with my neighbors. Everyone pretty much kept to themselves while still being friendly enough to wave or say hello. So when I saw the for sale sign go up next door, I didn't think much of it. New neighbors were always exciting and I hoped whoever moved in would be nice. Boy was I wrong. When Karen first walked through her new front door, I knew we'd have problems. She carried herself with an air of entitlement, walking around inspecting the place with her nose in the air. I tried to be nice and brought over a homemade casserole, figuring she could use a warm meal after the move. Karen took it with a grunt, then immediately handed it off to her movers, not even offering a thank you. Strike one. Over the next few weeks, she wasted no time making enemies of everyone on our block. She scolded kids for laughing too loudly while playing. She called the city to complain about dandelions in a neighbor's lawn. Nothing was too small for Karen to throw a fit over. Her shrill voice bellowed daily, grating on all our nerves. Still, I tried to keep the peace for the sake of neighborhood harmony. That resolve nearly snapped the day I caught her letting her dog poop all over my front yard. When I asked her politely to clean it up, she scoffed and said, It's just a little poop. Why should her precious princess have to hold it when my yard was right there? I bit my tongue hard enough to taste blood and cleaned it myself, vowing to install security cameras. Soon after, I overheard Karen bragging on the phone about a two-week Caribbean vacation she had booked. I said a silent prayer, relieved at the thought of her absence. Well, God must have been busy that day because my relief was short-lived. The morning Karen left, I sat down with my coffee to enjoy a peaceful view of the sunrise, but instead of my grassy backyard, I was met with a horrifying sight. There stood a freshly stained cedar fence, cutting a full fifteen feet into my property. That witch had erected a fence in the middle of the night, annexing half my yard as her own. I spit coffee across the kitchen. Still in my robe and slippers, I stormed outside to investigate. Yep, this was no optical illusion. That fence now marked the edge of my much smaller lawn. I peered through the slats to find Karen's tacky patio furniture occupying my previously open space. She had even stuck little reflectors along the top edge as if claiming her territory. I saw red. How dare she trespass on my property and erect any kind of structure without my permission. I glanced around in disbelief, noticing for the first time the lush new garden she had planted behind the fence. Flowers and shrubs that certainly hadn't been there yesterday. Overnight, she had added a whole new landscaped area to her backyard using my land. Fury brewed inside me as I paced the yard. Sure, I could tear down her cheap cedar fence, but that would likely spark World War III, with her somehow twisting it to make me look like the aggressor. No, I needed to handle this carefully if I wanted to reclaim my rightful property. After calling my trusted lawyer, I had a plan of action. I installed security cameras angled right at her fence, gathering video evidence of her illegal encroachment. I contacted a land surveyor who of course confirmed my original property lines, proving her fence sat squarely on my land. Finally, I notified the county of her unpermitted construction that violated zoning regulations. Armed with documentation, I decided to give Karen one chance to make things right. I slipped a letter in her mailbox, politely asking her to remove the fence and restore my yard by the time she returned from vacation. Surely once confronted with irrefutable evidence, she would see reason. Or so I hoped. The day Karen returned, my stomach churned as I watched from my window. A taxi pulled up right on schedule. Out she climbed, somehow looking even angrier than normal. I braced myself for the explosion sure to come, once she realized her fence had been reported. But as the day dragged on, things remained eerily quiet next door. No irate pounding at my door. No string of profanity-laced texts. Just tense silence. The following morning I awoke eager to see if the fence had been dismantled. I crept to the window, wary of what I might find. Peeking through the blinds, I gasped. Not only had she kept the fence... But overnight, she had expanded the stolen territory even farther into my property. Gone was the carefully curated legal response I had envisioned. I saw nothing but rage. This woman had already taken 15 feet of my land and now help herself to even more. I flew out the front door, not even bothering to put on shoes. As I stormed towards the fence, plotting to rip it down with my bare hands if needed, something near the road caught my eye. A shiny new plaque next to Karen's mailbox that definitely hadn't been there before. As I got closer, the engraved words became legible. The Wilson Residence, established 2022. My heart dropped into my stomach. That conniving crook had changed her legal address. 
She was laying claim to my land by updating county records to show it as part of her own property. That explained her boldness in expanding the fenced area. As far as the county was concerned, all this fell under her residence now. I saw through her scheme immediately. She sought to quietly annex my land before I could mount a legal challenge, a backdoor way to redraw property lines without my consent. It was downright diabolical. This meant war. I immediately called my lawyer and we filed an injunction, using my surveys and camera footage to contest her changed address. We petitioned the county records be corrected to reflect true property boundaries and demanded they force her to vacate the annexed land. Meanwhile, I informed my neighbors of her underhanded tactics and asked them to write statements attesting they had known the land to be mine for over 15 years. Photos were dug up documenting decades of my yard in its original larger size. I was rallying the troops for the battle ahead. At the injunction hearing, Karen feigned ignorance. She claimed the contractor must have misread the blueprints and made the fence too large by mistake, an innocent error she would happily remedy. Crocodile tears streamed down her cheeks as she pledged deep remorse for the misunderstanding. My evidence exposed her act. In the end, the judge ordered her to immediately remove the fence and vacate all illegally occupied land. She wailed about losing her precious garden, but her pleas fell on deaf ears. She had 30 days to comply or face fines of $100 per day it remained. Karen glared daggers at me as the gavel slammed down. I had won this round, but something told me this feud was far from over. She still had that deranged spark of defiance in her eyes. I would need to keep vigilant if this dragon dared breathe fire my way again. For now, though, justice had been served. As I looked out on my rightfully restored yard, I planted my own little garden near the property line, a cheerful row of sunflowers, their bright petals always facing in Karen's direction. Let her rage at their resilient beauty. After all she put me through, it was the least I could do. The next one is a pro-revenge story. A few years ago, on a different Reddit account, I mentioned that I was in an interracial relationship. A Redditor reached out to me and told me I was a race traitor and unfaithful to my race. I was like, um, what the heck, bro? I looked at his account. It was six years old, which told me his username was likely something he used a lot. So I started googling his username at Gmail, username at Yahoo, etc., etc., and I found a match with Hotmail. A guy by the name of, let's say, Jeff was selling some NFL game tickets and had posted his email. Now this doesn't necessarily mean it's the same person. However, in the post, he mentioned a city in America and that he was a fan of a particular football team. I went through the Reddit user post history. He posted quite a bit in the respective city subreddit. He mentioned going to NFL games, and in another post, he also said he was born in Canada. So through the ad for the NFL ticket, I figured out his real name. I found his biography on his employer's website. He was a senior-level manager, so they had a bio for him. In that bio, they mentioned he was born in Canada, was a fan of said NFL team, and loved living in the city. I also found his LinkedIn page during this time, so I sent him a connection request on LinkedIn, which he accepted. I figured he would because he had 500-plus connections. So here's what we know. His username matches his email handle. He likes the NFL team. He lives in a said city that he posts in said city's subreddit. He was born in Canada. I then found his Facebook page. His Facebook page was public, and he posted what I would describe as semi-racist material. Also, his Reddit page was significantly more racist. Based on the numerous connecting factors I determined, so I create a report. I included screenshots and links and summarized my findings in that report. Now, based on this person's position in his company, he likely had a significant role in deciding who this company employs. Also, his company clearly stated they were an equal opportunity employer. So I called their HR department, I found the number, and I called them, and I asked them, Would you be concerned if a senior-level manager in your organization was a proud racist and degraded your equal opportunity employment policies? They were concerned. So I told them I had done an investigation into one of their senior-level managers and described he was racist, and I had put together all my evidence and findings in a report and could email it over to them. I emailed them the report. A few weeks later, I called to get an update, and I was told they appreciated my report. However, they would have to comment on the status of their decision and make public statements in regard. Basically, thanks for letting us know, but we aren't going to tell you anything. That's fine. So I waited another month, and I kept checking his LinkedIn page. Then one day, I saw a LinkedIn post from him in which he said he is looking for a new opportunity and if anyone had any positions open. So I messaged him on Reddit, and I told him, Hey bro, heard you got fired. 
Just want you to know I'm the reason why. He threatened to find out who I was, hunt me down, assault my spouse, and strangle me to death. So I reported him to Reddit admins who promptly permabanned him. Now, he really should have learned his lesson, because guess what? He didn't connect the dots. He didn't know I could see all his LinkedIn activity. He didn't know who I was. He simply acted in rage. So I put his newest message in his folder and added it to the report. Because you see, I can be an incredibly vindictive person. I checked his LinkedIn once a week. Good news. He got another job. Bad news. Their HR department was also quite easy to get a hold of and discuss their new hire's online racist, threatening behavior. However, let's just say I had a lovely conversation with this HR representative. She was a woman, and based on how she sounded and her name, I suspect she was a woman of color. So, yeah. I'm not sure what happened after this because a few weeks later his internet history was cleaned up and his LinkedIn page was deleted. However, this company listed their senior management, which was what his position was. I never saw his name listed. What I suspect happened is after his HR reviewed my evidence, they terminated his employment with them. I would have totally gone after him a third time, but he got smart the second time around. The next one is a petty revenge story. A few years ago, I rented a house with two other women. We were all in our mid-20s, working full-time and with various social obligations. We kept the house tidy, though sometimes a dish or two was left in the sink for later if we were running late. Nell all fake names in this post, called a roommate meeting and said we should all wash our dishes when we're done using this. No problem, right? That's what we mostly did, except for the rare occasion when somebody was running late. We were extra conscientious about it afterward, however. A few weeks later, I came home one afternoon to my other roommate Petra, standing in the kitchen and looking annoyed. Above the sink was a post-it note reading, Per our previous conversation, please don't leave dirty dishes in the sink. In the sink was a coffee cup, small plate, and spoon. Petra had missed her alarm, and I guess Nell came home during her lunch break, saw the mess, and left a note. But here's the thing. This was the first time Petra or I had left anything in the sink since that conversation. Nell, however, regularly left her dishes in the sink until the next day. The next night, Petra and I come home after Nell was asleep. She left a cup in the sink. Petra ran to her room, grabbed a pile of sticky notes, and wrote, Per our previous conversation, please don't leave dirty dishes in the sink. I asked if I could leave a note, and it spiraled from there. Between the two of us, we left every step for washing a dish. A note on the soap, soap is your friend. By the sponge, use me to scrub away dirt. The faucet, you're almost there, rinse here. And the towel, last step, dry, then put away. I was the first to leave the next morning. Upon returning home, the sink was empty, and a single post-it remained. I don't appreciate the passive aggression. The next one is a malicious compliance story. This happened around mid-2006. I was a low-level team leader in a tech consulting company. I was in charge of two teams, each with three members. The client was a bank. If you've ever worked with a bank, you know that technology moves pretty slowly in a bank. For instance, the project we worked on was in Java 1.3, which was deprecated in March 2006. One of the guys on my team, let's call him Max Powers, was the kind of guy who's always trying to be on the cutting edge of everything. He repeatedly asked to migrate the project to a newer version of Java, or to be assigned to a project with more up-to-date tech. There were such projects, he just wasn't assigned to one. But I couldn't accommodate those requests. I knew he was unmotivated because of this, and I was also pretty bummed about having to work with outdated technology. So, we both started researching open-source tools to use in the company that were cutting edge and proposed some improvements to our manager. He liked the idea, so he formed a task force to create tools for the company, and the task force consisted of Max and myself. However, this was a side job. Our main responsibilities were still on the bank project. One day, during a team project leaders and managers meeting, we were discussing desired and undesired turnover, people leaving the company, and how to prevent it. I brought up Max's case saying that having someone extremely focused on cutting-edge tech doing boring, outdated stuff was probably a recipe for undesired turnover. The manager said, You're wrong. This is totally desired turnover. We want people motivated to work here, and he's not. I said, But he's not motivated because you're unwilling to move him to a project with better tech. Plus, he's one of our best assets by far. He's doing the work of two, three people, and the task force. We wouldn't want him to leave it would be a problem. The manager then said, then it's your fault. You have to motivate him better. I stopped arguing. 
To me, Max leaving was clearly a case of undesired turnover. It was a problem for my planning, and furthermore, it meant losing someone whom I saw as one of the top assets available in the company. But the manager said that I needed to motivate Max better. Cue malicious compliance. So I did. I motivated him to get the hell out of the company. He wasn't going to be allowed to work on cutting-edge projects there. He found a new and exciting job in no time. He's a millionaire now. He even got called by Google to interview with them. He rejected the offer. He could have been retired by age 38, but he kept on working because he still loves what he does. We struggled to cover for him. We had to hire two more devs, and the task force came to an end. I couldn't do it just by myself, and the rest of the devs weren't as interested in it. The next one is an entitled people story. My girlfriend and I moved in with her parents after closing the lease on an apartment we left due to a dangerous roommate and unsafe conditions. Ever since we've moved in, she's been doing everything she can to make my life hell, but that's another story. This is something I got revenge doing. I have a six, five-month-old boxer puppy I'll call Phoebe. My mother-in-law has a lab, a healer, and a pug mix. The problem is the lab I'll call her Lily. Lily has attacked the healer, Pug Mix, who is playing and has one eye, and both cats in the house. She attacks over food and toys, or if they get on a couch she decides she wants on. It's horrible, and she's hurt them pretty bad. I do not let my puppy out to play with her without me there. However, my mother-in-law has taken to coming and getting her out of her crate and letting her out to play with Lily no matter what my girlfriend and I tell her. If you don't let her out, I'll just come get her after you leave. No, she's gonna come out. I don't care if you're sleeping, I want her. Well, I like her, so she's coming out. I don't care what you want. Lily is harmless. You don't know anything about dogs, anyway. She's obviously trying to take my dog and takes any chance to elude that I'm abusing her and can't handle her. She stole the healer and lab from my brother-in-law and his girlfriend by using the same behavior. I work night shift in healthcare. She comes in right after I fall asleep in the evening before work and takes Phoebe. If I lock the door, she bangs on it until I get up or Spam calls my girlfriend and me. Cue the revenge. I'm working on training Phoebe to not bark and cry in her crate. In order to be let out to eat, she has to lay down quietly and wait a few minutes upon command in her crate. Recently, I started knocking on the door before I open it with food, and she is let out without her cue. Then I went out into the hall and came back in without the special knock, just two taps, and made her wait. Soon she didn't need to be told the cue. So my mother-in-law couldn't get this dog out of the crate when she broke into my room after I left. She didn't know to knock, so Phoebe clung to the kennel and refused to let up, knowing that if she left before being told she could, she wouldn't get a treat at all. And if there's any breed that holds a grudge for treats, it's boxers. I get home, don't even make it through the door before she demands I let the dog out. I know by the look on her face that my plan worked and Phoebe didn't leave the kennel. That means she definitely needs to go outside. So I go to the door, Knock, enter, and open the crate. She shoots out like a bullet and hurdles outside. Mother-in-law stops her, picking her up and swinging her away from me. Before she can say anything or accuse me of anything, Phoebe decides to let her bladder loose. All 35 pounds of puppy, a full bladder, and the most smug face a dog can make. Mother-in-law hasn't touched her since, and I'm pretty sure she threw away her urine-soaked clothes. Update. While I was eating dinner, Lily bit Phoebe over the literal smell of food. Mother-in-law said nothing as I rushed my pup to the bathroom. She's fine, just has a torn up lip. She's in good spirits. I'll be buying a lock for the kennel and chain to keep the key on my neck. The next one is an entitled parent story. My friend, let's call him Jim, is currently entangled in a legal battle with a father who wants to dig up, disinter his deceased wife, and move her body to another grave space to hide her from his daughter. What is his motive? She won't bring him cigarettes while he's in a nursing home dying of some lung disease, and where having cigarettes near his oxygen tank could explode the whole building. Now usually no matter how petty this kind of thing is, we have to do it if the dad had paid for the burial and space the wife is located in. Except he didn't. The daughter he is trying to hide the deceased mother from is the one who paid for the space and the burial of the mother. He legally can't move her because he doesn't own the grave or the right to move his wife. So now he has this poor woman and my friend Jim locked in a legal battle to move his wife and hide her. Oh, and he paid his son, the woman's brother who is estranged from the family, to break into her house and try to steal the contract for the mother's burial so he has more leverage. So the brother is in jail and the daughter has a restraining order against them both. All over cigarettes.
Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.